Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Welcome to the fourth and final webinar in a four-part series presented by American Jewish Committee and Tablet Magazine titled 21st Century Europe and the Jews. Over these four programs, AJC and Tablet are exploring timely issues related to Jewish life and the protection of democ democracies in Europe. Today's program will explore Germany's history as well as its current challenges. Joining us today, our senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and U.S. National Security Council Senior Director from 2005 to 2007, Michael Duran, publisher and editor of Die Zeit, Joseph Yaffe, visiting fellow for the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution, Jamie Kerchik, AJC Berlin Raymer Institute for German-Jewish Relations Director, Remco Limus, and political communication and strategy consultant, Melody Susarowitz. Moderating today's program is Tablet Magazine News Editor, Jeremy Stern. After we hear from our guests, time permitting, we will take your questions. You may submit your questions through the Q&A feature in Zoom. Jeremy, the floor is yours. Welcome everyone. I'm very pleased to be here with our esteemed panel. We uh, had the good fortune of coincidentally scheduling this panel for what turned out to be one day before a new German government takes over and the Bundestag swears in a new chancellor for the first time in 16 years. So we'll have a chance to get to uh, Mr. Schultz and the Greens and the FDP uh, later in the discussion, but uh, this is a panel about the role of history and historical memory in contemporary Germany. So let's start with a question about Germany's culture of remembrance. Um, so on the one hand, it seems that Germany uh, remains the model of a country that faces its past head on, takes responsibility for the sins of previous generations and finds ways to genuinely atone for them, at least with compared with uh, most other countries in the world. And then on the other hand, the rising generation of Germans, uh, we're now talking about the great grandchildren of the Nazi period, some now five generations removed from the Holocaust. Um, in some cases, wondering why they should forever be made to feel responsible for crimes in which they had no complicity and maybe being barred from expressing certain political and cultural preferences that are considered normal in other countries, nationalism, patriotism, et cetera. Um, so how should we think about these two realities and how do you think they'll be reconciled in the coming years? Uh, Dr. Jaffe, let's start with you. There is, there's two things that we need to, need to stress. One thing is that as far as the official policy on Jews and remembrance couldn't be more exemplary, as you just mentioned, as far as <clears throat> given Germany and the rest, um, there's no, <clears throat> no flaw, no problem, and no second thoughts here. The other problem is um, something that is true for most of the West, which is basic, feeling critical of Israel, and you never quite know whether it's Israel or whether it's Jews as such. Anti-Zionism is, um, is a good way to mask deeper, deeper resentments and hatreds. But as far as, <clears throat> to come back to the first, first point is that Jews here are extremely well protected. Official rhetoric is flawless almost ideal. The only problem that I see is something else, which is demography. And we'll get to that, I think, I hope. Uh, basically, <clears throat> we are dealing with a declining Jewish community in Germany. Uh, Melody. I very much agree with Mr. Joffe. The official stance on Germany's culture of commemoration is flawless. It is nothing that uh, is at scare of fading away. The question is rather the how. And uh, looking at the way the statistics show the rise of anti-Semitism in all its various forms today and over the past years, I believe that there's room for an overall health check uh, for Germany's commemoration culture to see why it doesn't work the way it should and what kind of overall overhaul it could require to enable the German youth and the young generations who uh, 
uh, Nolan's Volen suffer from the historization of the Holocaust, who don't uh, anymore have the direct witnesses uh, and, and the family stories about it, how to help them develop a healthy form of commemorating and, and an effective form of commemorating, namely one that does not create guilt feelings, but one that creates sensitivity, historical responsibility, um, with a very strong look into the future. Thank you, Dr. Dren. Uh, thanks. Uh, I, I think uh, my role on this uh, panel is to be an uh, uh, interested outsider. I'm neither a, uh, neither a Jew nor a German, uh, but I have great interest in both um, and great interest in the state of Israel. And when, when I look at this question, also, as a, as a policy professional in Washington, what I'm struck um, by is what I would call Germany's um, conflicted feelings about being a great power. It, it has Germany's problem with power uh, because of the legacy uh, uh, of the Holocaust, the, the Germans, uh, uh, for uh, very good reasons, have become uh, extremely wary of uh, using hard power. Um, and yet we find ourselves in this situation today where they are a great power, uh, except for the fact that they are uh, lacking they're in them. In, in the, they're, they're nearly a great power. Let's see, they're a, they're, a, they're, a, they're a threshold great power. They have an enormous amount of influence, but they're lacking they're lacking some of the tools that a great power has, and they have a conflicted feeling about that power. And a lot of that comes out with respect to, to Israel. And on, on, on the issue um, that I think um, is most pressing of the day to day, the Iran question, I think, uh, I think they end up coming out on the wrong side of this um, in that they are, they're, um, ideology, I would say, that they have developed about how one gets beyond the problems of the use of power has led to a sort of um, mania, maybe that's an exaggeration, let's say a preference for uh, economic and diplomatic engagement over all other forms of um, the use of power. And I think that that is um, serving Israel poorly even though the, the Germans, I think, are very sincere in their belief that they have a special responsibility toward Israel. Uh, me. Yeah, okay. um, well, I would complicate that last comment, Mike. I think Germany is a moral power, or they see themselves as a moral power. Uh, and this, is, this, this, this can be a little confusing. Um, they, because they've given up the idea of military force, they think that moral suasion uh, can be a substitute. And I think this is a broadly shared view among uh, many German political leaders. Um, with regards to history, however, I wanna add a, a wrinkle to what, we've dis to what we've been talking about. And um, I agree that the official position on, on remembrance uh, and anti-Semitism from the German government is absolutely exemplary. But we do see a problem with anti-Semitism among Muslim migrants to the country. And I think in recent years, um, I've often read or seen arguments being made in favor of large-scale immigration from certain parts of the world where anti-Semitism is rife. And the argument being made in support of it is because of our past as Germans, we need to sort of open the gates to people who are oppressed overseas. And that's obviously an admirable um, impulse, but when it is being sort of used simplistically to defend the you know, large scale importation of people uh, with views about Jews that are, uh, if they were expressed by you know, an ethnic German or a native German, however you wanna uh, put it, um, they have views that are that that would be considered extreme right, uh, and when you see large protests with Israeli flags being burned and uh, anti-Semitic slogans being chanted by young Muslim men, um, I think this is a problem. And so I think we've seen the the historical lessons of Germany sort of being uh, 
perhaps not fully understood or maybe politically manipulated to support policies that in the long term, I think may endanger Jews. And as we've seen in countries like France are leading to uh, a kind of slow trickle exodus of Jews from that country. Um, can I say something about the anti-Semitism? Sure. <clears throat> there is, there is, there's lots of unsettling news. You read them every day in the newspapers. And <clears throat> just as Jamie has just told us, I, I'd like to look at numbers. And the AJC, by the way, has done a lot of good work on public opinion surveys. And what I find reassuring just looking at the numbers <clears throat> is that measured German anti-Semitism in Germany is at the low end, certainly compared to countries like Hungary and Poland and Czechia and Greece of all places. So <clears throat> the Germans are back at the low end where they, as we all know, they weren't in the thirties and forties. And that gives me some assurance that has to be weighed against the dramatic and news that have to be taken seriously um, <clears throat> on, on a day by day level. I mean, to me, the most unsettling image is that when you have German policemen packing submachine guns, the machine guns are pointed outward from a synagogue, not inward. That's a tremendous change compared to the 30s and 40s. But it's still the fact that uh, <clears throat> German uh, Jewish houses of worship or Jewish institutions have to be guarded by submachine toting policemen. Um, you have to, so you have to, what I'm trying to say is you have to compare and weigh against each other images and numbers. And the numbers I find certainly in comparative terms are pretty reassuring compared to the rest of Europe. If I may, if I may um, add to that, that in terms of the classical anti-Semitism in Germany, this is true. Uh, numbers are on the low side and uh, not necessarily in a rising trend, but when it comes to the many other faces of anti-Semitism, the opposite is true. And especially when it comes to Israel-related anti-Semitism, uh, which as uh, some of us already said, uh, is the new form or a modern form of anti-Semitism. And this is on the rise. And so much so that I believe uh, the more recent surveys in Germany have shown uh, something that comes close to half um, of the population or at least 40% when it comes to uh, a certain identification with anti-Semitic resentment in the context of um, Israel criticism. And these are all numbers coming out of, of German government agencies, not, not pro-Israel or, or Jewish NGOs. So this is something that is of, of great concern, especially because it doesn't take an extremist on either of the fringes, not a, a leftist nor a, a right-wing extremist in order to wrap up this anti-Jewish resentment in the form of Israel criticism. This is something that more and more in German society we find in the mainstream and uh, the trend is rising over the past decades. And this is a threat, by the way, not only to Jews in Germany, um, but especially to the, uh, the very democratic fabric of German society. And this in itself has not yet been met with a sufficient um, strategic approach on behalf of the German government and the various institutions responsible for this to, to be met efficiently and effectively um, over the past, uh, over the next few years. Can I ask a question, Melody? <clears throat> what kind of strategic approach would you recommend? I mean, would you have the government <clears throat> go out there in the schools and the public squares and spread the message or what? I mean, what are you going to do when you have a kind of mainstream press? I wouldn't call the mainstream media anti-Semitic, but they are very critical of Israel and that you can do any content analysis you want to do and you'll find the critical um, or dislike even uh, way overwhelm the, <clears throat> the sympathies. Having said that, I don't know what, what to do on the part of the state. What is the state supposed to do? 
So, so the beauty with a functioning strategy is to start by developing it and uh, to start with developing a strategic concept. And this is something that even as per the previous government commissions who were to analyze the anti-Semitism problem in Germany today has not yet happened. So targeted actions like appointing uh, the anti-Semitism combating um, uh, uh, responsibles on a government or on a local or on a national level, targeted actions um, like all kinds of conferences and political statements are good, but for them to be effective and to create change to such a strong social political uh, disease such as anti-Semitism, it requires an, 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 an overlook, an oversight, a general concept that takes into account all of the important, all of the relevant institutions from the judicial system, the education system, of course, media, yes, absolutely, social media, hell yes, and uh, a lot of additional component, and only when all of the relevant, and of course, the various um, uh, sociological strata in Germany, including the Muslim communities, of course, who in themselves require a targeted concept to, to create a difference, in, and, and that this is, by the way, not just the immigrants who came in 2015, but many of the radicalized Muslim communities who've been there for many decades, so once that is developed, um, uh, we can start talking about the effectiveness and about change. Until then, it remains a matter of slogans, of statements, of a lot of goodwill. And yes, there is a lot of goodwill and good intention. But looking at the statistics and at the situation of Jews in Germany on the ground, it doesn't look so rosy. How do we do this? How do we do this? Talk people out of anti-Semitism? It's never been done before. It has never succeeded. <laughs> The Holocaust and anti-Semitism didn't, the Holocaust didn't start with the Holocaust. Um, it started with a systematic uh, uh, propaganda and a systematic spread distribution of hate information. Yeah. And today we find ourselves in a situation where uh, conspiracy theories and incitement, anti-Semitic incitement, are distributed on an exponential level in the speed of light. So if this in itself uh, is just being let free with here and there some legislation trying to hamper it, but not really tangible change on the ground, um, then we don't have to be surprised that the, 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 the anti-Semitic resentment among the youth in Germany is on the rise. And, and by the way, one of the components missing, of course, is, to, is, is the matter of the social distance or on the opposite, the social proximity. And with the demographic problem of Jews in Germany being uh, on the decline and the fact that most of the Germans have never met a Jew, but they have met tons of images of ultra-Orthodox extremists in all kinds of um, articles by Der Spiegel or Süddeutsche Zeitung, or they have an image of the um, uh, Israeli soldier repressing uh, the Palestinians and so on, then inevitably you have the creation of an unhealthy resentment. And these are exactly the, and these are things that are reversible. Uh, creating proximity between German non-Jews and Jews is not a matter of rocket science. It's something that's that's possible. And even, uh, even uh, more of a proximity with Israel or Jews in Israel is something that today with the medium that we are using right now, Zoom, uh, something that is doable. So I, I, what I'm trying to say is it's, it's really a matter of uh, a creative concept and a strategy that encompasses all of the components involved that is needed to create a tangible difference. And I think it's possible. I, I want to give uh, Remco a, an opportunity to weigh in here. And Remco, before you do, I just want to ask an additional question about all of this. Um, we see a, a lot of uh, differences between um, Eastern and Western German lander uh, being pretty resilient, uh, even 30 years after reunification. Um, how, how much of a difference do you see in the problems of anti-Semitism or the, the culture of remembrance? How, how much do you see it differing across uh, Eastern and Western Germany or not? Well, um, uh, first of all, um, let me say that um, uh, I'm happy that we, uh, that AJC and Tablet partnered to, to host this conversation. And um, I feel like um, we've al already touched so many issues here um, that I would like to respond to. Um, and uh, like Mike, I'm also partly an observer, um, not being Jewish, but at least based in Berlin. Um, so that maybe give, gives me some insight. Um, I, I think I would like to, to make this even more complicated um, because um, there's an issue 
um, that we've seen over the last um, two to three years um, that is tied to, to um, how to situate the, the Holocaust in a global context, meaning that um, we've seen an academic debate, but it has you know, profound political implications about um, the uniqueness of the Holocaust and uh, if Auschwitz was unique. And um, this is something that is tied to the rise of post-colonial theory and um, the performance of these uh, ideas um, see at best you know, a difference in degree between uh, German and European colonialism and the Holocaust. And in general, of course, it's not problematic to you know, compare historical events. Um, uh, however, the advocates of these ideas and of these notions do not seek to differentiate between uh, uh, these events, but to equalize it. And that is something where we get into very dangerous territory because historically the questioning of the uniqueness of the Holocaust was something that we have only found on the on the right. And um, so I would add that when we talk about anti-Semitism, um, this is also something we need to take into account because I would call this like sort of a soft version of Holocaust uh, relativization. Um, uh, at, or trivialization, um, because at the end it's also an exoneration um, of, of the uh, German past and uh, um, uh, of the uh, you know the, 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 yeah, the German past, and um, uh, we of course see, see a difference between East and West, and I think that you know, I guess there are a lot of factors um, uh, playing into this, but I guess um, one of the underlying factors is that. In West Germany, we, at least uh, after um, after the Second World War, um, thanks to the U.S. and the Western Allies, um, a democratic system was established with the, you know, all the freedom that you have, freedom of speech. So you had a, a debate about the past beginning in the late '60s, um, uh, something that we haven't seen in the East for obvious reasons, because it was a dictatorship. By definition, the GDR was an anti-fascist state and uh, by that on the right side of history. So there was no need for, for a public debate about this. And, um, uh, and I think the consequence of this today, and, and this is something you can see in all polls, you can see in, you know, uh, the data shows you um, that there's a bigger problem when we talk about right-wing extremism, right-wing populism, in the eastern part of, of Germany. And again, that's an oversimplification, but I guess it's also something that we should need to take into account um, when, we, when we talk about this, this divide. Let's, uh, let's go back to a question that uh, Mike raised, and I'd like to hear uh, everyone's thoughts on it. So this is about uh, Germany's role in geopolitics and German foreign policy. So it, it seems to give kind of two contradictory impressions as a world power. Um, so on the one hand, Germany is anchored in NATO, it's pooled its sovereignty in the European Union, it's one of only 27 states in the European Council, surrounded by allies, hosts to US troops and nukes, kind of a pillar of multilateralism. Uh, and on the other hand, Germany is Europe's political and economic hegemon. It seems to have probably the most functional uh, strategic relationships with China and Russia out of every European country, often been the Hungarian and Polish government's advocate in Brussels. Um, and it seemed like uh, Angela Merkel had a kind of genius for managing these contradictions. Um, do you think that the new uh, SPD Green FDP government will be able to manage these contradictions as effectively as Merkel did? Or will some of these cross pressures break out into the open? Um, let's start with Mike and then uh, go to uh, Dr. Jaffe. Thanks, Jeremy. I, I wonder if I could uh, combine your question with a response to uh, the previous discussion, uh, because I, I would like to make a case um, for foreign policy to be the, the primary arena in which the German state addresses the problem of, of anti-Semitism. Um, for two reasons. One, I think the problem of the attitude toward Israel and what, what, was, what we were calling here, you know, um, anti-Semitic views, or at least um, views that are, that are, that are um, preset 
to be hostile to Israel is a very, very complex problem uh, for all Europeans, but especially for the, for the Germans. I mean, today, support for Israel throughout the entire West is almost synonymous for support for national sovereignty. Uh, and that's so deeply rooted in the, that's so deeply rooted in our culture because God gave a land to a people and that's what we're taught from the, uh, 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 from the Bible. So it becomes just synonymous with that. And the, the uh, contemporary Germany um, wants to believe that, that, that the exercise of independent sovereignty is itself the root of, the, uh, the, the root of evil in the, um, uh, in the world, as exemplified uh, by the Holocaust. So on the one hand, Germany has a special relationship with Israel and a special commitment to Israel's survival because of its past. On the other hand, Israel represents on, on a very deep level, not necessarily explicitly in anything that Germany is saying, but in Western culture, uh, uh, Israel represents those forces in Western culture that are, uh, that are the very root of the, um, of the problem. There's kind of no way out of this, especially for the Germans, I think, through just education, uh, because you have to dispense with an entire, uh, um, you know, an, an, an entire modern worldview in order to get somewhere else. But you can address it in terms of policy, because it's very, it's very simple to say a few things. One is, as Germans, uh, Germans freely admit, Germany has a special responsibility to the survival of Israel. There is a country in the world today which is building a nuclear weapon with the explicit with the explicit rationale of destroying Israel. There's only one country in the world that's doing that. Israel has a spe uh, Germany has a special responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. And uh, uh, having commercial relationships and uh, um, and uh, uh, engaging in moral suasion with that country is not likely to have any effect on it. And we have the evidences out on that. So I think just making that simple argument uh, um, is, an, is an effective way of, of not, it, it is one way, it's not, a, it's not gonna be a, a completely satisfactory way, but it is one way of addressing this problem of what we were describing as, as, as anti-Semitism. I think it's a little bit larger than, than, than anti-Semitism. The what what gets lost these it's not just that these there there are um, very critical images of Israelis and of Jews in the German media it's the absence of the uh, uh, of the critical uh, images of the uh, Iranians of Hezbollah of uh, of all of those elements out there that want to destroy Israel so I think. A, a kind of simpler way at the problem is to say, let's have more images of what the world is really like out there, what the real threat to Israel is out there, and what the responsibility of Germany is with regard to that threat. Let's go to Joe and then Jamie. <clears throat> uh, Joe, please. Me? Yes, yes. please. Um, um, I, I think, I think um, what we just heard is right. Um, Germany is a strange animal that <clears throat> is by all, <clears throat> by all measures a kind of great power, but doesn't have the mentality or the soul of a great power. And that has two reasons. One of course is inherited guilt. And the other one we, we haven't mentioned yet is that for 70 years, the Germans did not have to protect their own sovereignty. They had big brother in the United States <clears throat> who provided security, almost cost-free, and which relieved the Germans <clears throat> from taking, from doing the things that sovereign nations normally do. So <clears throat> what I don't quite see yet is how the, this kind of strategic animal or non-strategic animal Germany, how that relates to the issue we are talking about. Do you have, in other words, and to put it, to put it, um, in an exaggerated manner. Do you have to be a sovereign power and a strategic actor to like the Jews? I'm not sure there is a, kind, there is a logical connection between the two. Now, take as an example France. France still wants to be a great power and it, it does believe in sovereignty and nationhood. Yet the number of murderous anti-Semitic incidents in France way outpace 
what's happening in Germany. So this is just one footnote where I would, where I would <clears throat> want to know how sovereignty and strategic self-definition fits in with anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. We know one thing, anti-Israelism is a kind of very, you know, the simple psychological mechanisms. If you live with inherited guilt, by which I don't mean to say that today's generation in Germany is guilty, but if you live with this kind of inherited flaw, naturally you want to get rid of it. And how do you get rid of it? You project guilt onto the form of victims. And so, and you depict Israel as, at least on the in the extremes, both left and right, by the way, uh, <clears throat> as a fountainhead of evil and colonialism and racism. That has been with us for a long time, but I think, and I want to end this, it has nothing to do with the strategic personality of Germany. It has to do with what I call inherited guilt now in the third, fourth, fourth generation. And that we're not going to get rid of so quickly, especially since Jamie said, you know, Germany is a moral power. I've written the whole book uh, with a title in, in German, uh, The Career of a Moral Superpower. Um, that <clears throat> moral superpower is courtesy of the United States in the sense that Germany did not have to take care of its own security and still doesn't have to. Jamie. <clears throat> well, uh, related to what Joe just said about uh, guilt displacement, there's that, that great line, I think it was an Israeli psychologist who said the, the Germans will never forgive the Jews for the Holocaust. Or Auschwitz. Or, or for <laughs> Auschwitz, right, yeah. Um, someone brought up in the comments that there were uh, basically two promises that were made by the, the, the 68 generation in Germany. Uh, never again Auschwitz and never again war. And these are two mutually exclusive propositions because we know that Auschwitz ended and the only way Auschwitz could have been destroyed was because of a war. Um, and this first came to a test in terms of the German, uh, the, the, the German government and the German people really confronted this for the first time in the, in the 1990s um, during the first SPD Green Coalition, right? Where you had Joschka Fischer, the first Green Foreign Minister who, was, who had been a, a 68er and a, and a, and a radical. Um, and this was a major, major issue within the German Green Party. You know, are we pacifists? Um, in all in all cases, or are we going to make an exception when there is genocide on European soil? Is not our responsibility as Germans and also you know German leftists is not our responsibility to stop genocide from happening. And if that means going to war to stop it, then that's necessary. Um, and I think that we see this divide still in the German Green Party and in the German left more generally on a whole array of issues um, over nuclear weapons policy, for instance. There's a clause, I believe, in the coalition agreement of this new government uh, to remove the remaining American uh, warheads on German soil. And this was last an issue, as we all recall, in the early 1980s. It was a major issue, almost brought down the German government. Um, so I think this is going to continue to be, particularly now that the United States is slowly withdrawing from Europe and the sort of 70 year free ride that Germany has, has received is, uh, it's, that's no longer the case. I mean, Merkel famously gave that speech a couple of years ago, I believe it was in a, in a Munich beer hall during Oktoberfest where she said, you know, the, no. world, the world, what were, it was, it was, was it in Munich? I think it was the Munich security conference. Was it, was it, I thought it was in a beer hall. It was, it was in a, it was well, in a the beer hall. Everybody drinks, the the Hotel. Very Hotel. Very okay, okay, very different, very different. Everybody drinks the... beer in Munich. So it's nothing. <laughs> anyway, she gave this speech where she said things, the world has changed, Germany's position has changed, and we cannot rely. She was, you know, sort of not that vague, but sort of vague for diplomatic reasons. We can't rely on the same partners that we used to. This was not long after Brexit, not long after Trump was elected. Um, so Germany is going to have to start thinking more seriously about this. And back to the first question, you know, this, there comes a point when the German, uh, 
um, culture of remembrance and the attention to their history and the recognition of their history and the crimes they committed, there comes a point where I believe that can be instrumentalized in very cynical ways as an excuse not to defend yourself, not to defend your NATO allies in Eastern Europe. And the Russians have been very good at exploiting this German guilt, um, bringing up you know, the number of Soviet citizens who were killed by the Nazis and the crimes that were committed on the Eastern Front by the Wehrmacht. And you see these arguments then being recycled by Germans as a reason for why we can't deploy troops east to defend our actual treaty bound NATO allies in the Baltic states and Poland, or potentially Ukraine. Um, and I think that the Russians have been very skillful in their exploitation of German guilt. Uh, Melody, could you, uh, you could take up whatever thread uh, from that you want, but um, especially, could you speak to what uh, Mike brought up about uh, German foreign policy and especially its approach to Iran and how that's received uh, among Israeli uh, officials and policymakers, but also voters? So I think that there really is no doubt about the fact that uh, Germany's foreign policy has been strongly determined by the uh, collective trauma of World War II. And the Iran policy is, is quite a textbook uh, case study to analyze that. It is filled uh, with paradoxes, especially if you see it in the context of uh, um, Germany's relationship with Israel, but also in the context of Germany's own national uh, strategic interests. So um, this uh, policy uh, of appeasing a fundamentalist regime, which uh, not only on the soft matters like human rights, the values, uh, it promotes the fundamentalist ideology, it tries to um, spread not just in the region, all over the world pretty much, but also in terms of the hard uh, threats, the ballistic missiles, the nuclear weapons, uh, the export of terror, um, uh, to the Middle East and Africa. So when you look at that entire pool of threats and see that still, and you know what, add to that uh, the planning or the plotting of terrorist attacks uh, by the uh, Revolutionary Guards on European soil while after the JCPOA was signed already. When you look at this, this entire pool, you really wonder what is it that still uh, makes German policymakers stick to this appeasement policy of by all means treating the Iranians as, as if, or the Iranian regime, the mullahs, as if they were Swiss policymakers and um, trying to stick to the conventional European Western minded diplomatic means to get something out of them. Everybody knows um, that they will never get, which is a peaceful Iran. There was a wonderful chance to see this happening an opportunity, an historical opportunity after the JCPOA was signed. Um, in 2015, and uh, everybody was possibly holding the European leaders negotiating that agreement, possibly were holding their breath and trying to see that now the policy would shift, uh, aggressions would, uh, would uh, decline, but the opposite was the case. Ballistic missile development uh, testing was increased massively. The terror of export was increased massively. Uh, Hezbollah alone received $700 million annually through the petrodollars that uh, flew into Iran after sanctions were lifted. Instead of pumping that money into the Iranian infrastructure, the economy, and, and to the people who desperately needed that. So looking at this overall picture and seeing that we reached now 2021 and not much has changed except for possibly the rhetoric here and there. And yes, snapback mechanisms were activated in the past, but nothing really happened. Um, then you really wonder, cui bono, as the Roman said, in whose interest is this and, and whose interest does it serve? And again, I'm not speaking only about Israel's security interests. Um, I'm speaking about Western interests in the region and it also European security. It is not a secret that, and, and, and Salehi, the, the head of the, former head of the Iranian Atomic Energy, it 
said it more than once, the ballistic missiles, uh, the development in, is on the rise and some of these missiles can reach European countries. So why still stick on to the same uh, sort of diplomatic cores and rhetoric that in the past showed or proved to be failing? Um, well, maybe I, I would add that, first of all, I'm, I'm always astonished by the fact that when we talk about Iran and the threat emanating from Iran, especially from its nuclear weapons program, and when you talk to people in Berlin, that especially in Germany, of all places, um, you have to explain um, that if there, when there's a regime that threatens to kill millions of Jews, that maybe they are serious. So, and um, that is something that um, yeah, always astonishes me that uh, that there's uh, uh, you know that, that there's no connection then to the remembrance culture and to to what has happened here. And I guess a, an underlying problem um, in Germany is that there's a lack of or that there's just no threat perception. And the view from Berlin, again, I'm oversimplifying, is the world is full of partners or potential partners. And if we just you know, engage, um, if we just have enough dialogue, um, we can solve all these problems. So it doesn't matter if we talk to our counterparts in France or in Tehran. And um, this is something for all the reasons also uh, Josef Biosa has mentioned and uh, Mike has mentioned, um, uh, is sort of where we yeah, sort of the, the underlying um, issue, and um, I I hope I hope that the new government um, will at least change this. Um, I mean, uh, uh, if you look at the Greens, and I mean, also you know, we can talk a lot about the Greens, but. Um, uh, at least what they say about Russia, what they say about China, and um, this is something very different. Um, and, and of course, um, it's always easy to have this position and, or, or take these positions when you're, when you're in the opposition. But I guess, um, and I'm hopeful that we will see at least to some degree a change in German foreign policy. And, um, uh, and I am especially hopeful when it comes to Russia. And I guess that, um, and Jamie mentioned it, that the Kremlin was very good in weaponizing the, the history um, and you know, its relationship with Germany. And I think this, this, will, be, this will be harder for, for the Kremlin in the future. And um, so I'm, I'm at least a little hopeful that that will change, but I will not, I do not expect a fundamental change of German foreign policy also when it comes to, you know, hard power and, uh, and applying hard power. I mean, it took this country 10 years to solve the question if we should have armed drones or not. And um, so this is where we are uh, uh, right now. Can I add something to this or do we have enough time? Please go ahead. Yes? Yes. Go ahead. I think I want to add to this. Look, the first commandment of German grand strategy is to stay out of harm's way. Once the corollary follows, you want to maintain good relations with everybody and his brother as far as possible. So you have the Franco-German couple, but not too much because both countries are <clears throat> underhandedly vying for primacy in Europe. You have the tie to the United States, but you, you also want to protect your, your, your flank from Russia and therefore have reasonably good relations with them too. And you want to have decent relations with China, which is Germany's most important trading partner at this, at this point. Having said that, I want to, want to emphasize what Rem just said, given this carefully balanced matrix of interests, that makes for a certain kind of immobility, uh, you do have to look out for the small changes. And the small changes, let me repeat, is Germans have become harsher on, on Iran. They have become harsher on, 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 on Russia. They, um, they have, even under Merkel, they became a bit harder on China, uh, trying to, to, 
to exclude as much they could uh, the theft of technology. And uh, you have at least some escalatory rhetoric, rhetoric on the Ukraine. So you, what I was saying here is, no, there is no not going to be a fundamental change in grand strategy of a country that has learned for 70 years to stay out of harm's way and not to pay any price for it. So you have to look at how things change at the margin. And as we speak, they are changing at the margin. Again, it's not going to be a strategic re reversal. But as I said, you have to be grateful for small things. I want to get in one more question before we uh, go to audience Q&A. Um, and this kind of touches on a lot of uh, topics that have already been brought up. So Germany has been criticized a lot in the last several years, including maybe especially by its allies for what uh, a lot of its allies consider to be kind of mercantilist Germany first economic policies. And this predates the Trump administration, but it certainly seemed to accelerate them. Um, and one theory out there that I think some people might be uh, familiar with is that um, the German establishment is actually kind of at pains to protect German voters from the kinds of economic changes that have led to nationalist or populist uh, movements uh, in uh, Southern Europe, in Britain with Brexit, in the United States with Trump, um, and that, you know, maybe the, the German establishment is not just any establishment because uh, German nationalism is not just any kind of nationalism. Um, and it has to be avoided or at least delayed into the future at all costs. Um, so I'm curious uh, for everyone's take, I mean, how, how present is this theory really in, in the minds of German officials and policymakers or, or are German voters really just kind of expressing very normal preferences for stability and predictability that we see in a, in a lot of other democracies? Um, let's start with uh, Dr. Jaffe. Well, you just said it. I think, you know, the Germans used to be the, the great outsider, the outlier in European history. What's impressive now is how normal, quote unquote, they've become like everybody else. And as I said, had said before, they're actually better on the anti-Semitism scale than, than others. Let me get, let me get, damn it. Um, they are like, they're like everybody else. As you just said, it's stability over others, it's predictability, don't bother us, and uh, take care of the welfare state of an expanding welfare state that will protect us against all kinds of vagaries now, now and forever. So what I'm always struck by is how normal the Germans have become. And normal means uh, in the European context that here's a bunch of ex-great powers that once conquered the, the four corners of the world. Um, that, has now be, that has now basically, we have now basically become as aggressive as pussycats, with some exceptions by the Brits and by the French, who still have some remnants of a warrior culture. But the rest has no longer has a strategic vocation. And the rest is looking inward to an ever more perfect protective welfare state. Having said that, I can only conclude nations conceived this way are not going to go out there in search of enemies to defeat. And, and the only thing that keeps Europe from taking care of its strategic necessities is of course the United States. And so I can only hope, I hope the United States stays in forever um, and to keep their wonderful garden of Eden that is pacified and social democratic Europe. Uh, Mike, uh, I, would you would you say, uh, at least from the standpoint of American interests, um, you know, it seems like sometimes we threaten to leave Germany, and often the Germans seem like they, they it seems like they're kind of calling a bluff. They they know we'd never leave. I mean, what do you see as from the standpoint of American interests? Um, is kind of you know keeping some level. I think there's somewhere about fifty thousand, somewhere between thirty and fifty thousand U.S. troops on German soil. Are we mostly there to protect Germany? Are we mostly there because it serves American interests? Do you see this changing at any point in the future? 
I'm I, I have a slight disagreement with uh, with with Joe on on this question. Um, so. I I, uh, I don't the the Germans. Um, I, uh, I I think we're I think our troops are there for uh, uh, both of the reasons that you say. I mean, this is part of the way that we maintain this system. But uh, having worked in the White House, one of the I came to the White House after being a professor, and one of the things that really surprised me to learn about foreign policy is the extent to which it's a social activity. Um, and when you look at American secretaries of state, when they, even though we're saying we're, we are pivoting to Asia and so forth, if you look at the society that is, has most influence on them, it is the Europeans still to, 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 to this day. So um, the kind of pussycat attitudes that, uh, that Joe mentioned that the Germans have are, are not limited to, um, uh, I, have, I have two, two criticisms of that view. Um, okay. uh, uh, what, one, is, one is that it has an enormous influence on American policymakers. And it strengthens, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a, um, if, if I take it back specifically to the Iran question, which is what I think, you know, which is what I think that as far as German Jewish relations today, forget about the history, but today, what really matters is that Iran not get a nuclear weapon. Uh, and the, the, uh, the hostility of the Germans, active hostility, not just to military coercion, but Germans are hostile to, the, to coercion as an instrument of foreign policy in general, including economic coercion. Now, that's also, a, that's also a, um, uh, an ideology that's deeply rooted in, a, in, in, in their, in their um, fraught history, but it's also one that is uh, quite beneficial to a country that is, that is, that is a major economic yes. power, right? It can serve both interests at the same, at the same time. So, my point here is that Germany is today a strategic actor, even if it doesn't have some of the strategic tools. And German officials know that they are that they are that they have significant influence globally and over the United States. So, uh, you know, I think that we have to actively argue with the Germans about this question of coercion. It doesn't have to be through drones and and, and, and tanks, but through economic uh, uh, coercion. And they have a, uh, they, you know, they, there is this quality, um, uh, the Germans, Melody uh, Minch, uh, uh, moved in the direction of calling it hypocrisy. Uh, I don't think that's wrong, but, you know, I'm really struck when I go to the Museum of the Cold War. I think it's there, it's close to the Brandenburg Gate. And you see the German, the German understanding of how the Cold War ended. And then you think about the American understanding of the Cold War ended. When Americans think about how the Cold War ended, it ended because Ronald Reagan went for Star Wars, bankrupted the Soviet Union, put troops in or put uh, uh, Stinger missiles in Afghanistan. It, it ended because we squeezed them with hard power, hard military power and hard economic power. The German description of how the Soviet Union collapsed begins with, with Willy Brandt's Ostpolitik and the, and the German engagement of the, uh, uh, of, the, of, of the Soviet Union. I don't think this is hypocritical. I think this is really deeply ingrained in the German uh, uh, state these days, that this is how you deal with difficult actors. You engage with them and you trade with them and you develop mutual dependencies and that then moderates them. And I, I think we have to attack this notion directly, especially with regard to Iran, because it's having a bad effect in terms of bilateral relations between uh, uh, Germany and Iran. And it's having a bad effect in that it is strengthening all of the wrong voices in Washington where I live. Uh, with apologies to the audience, uh, some of whom I think have submitted uh, questions. I think uh, the questions that's just been raised uh, is so fascinating, what Mike just talked about, that I want to use the remaining uh, six minutes we have to let the other panelists um, respond to it. So um, if anyone wants to respond to what Mike just said, please go ahead. May I just uh, follow up on what Mike said? Um, and uh, this is exactly what I meant with, with uh, there's no threat perception and the world is full of 
partners or potential partners and the Ostpolitik as an example on how to engage Russia. Um, but always forgetting that the Ostpolitik uh, was only possible because of, I don't know, 20, 25 division of uh, uh, US armed soldiers stationed in Germany and by that securing Western Germany. And um, when it comes to Iran, uh, obviously I agree with all the criticism that all of you have voiced you know, when it comes to German um, Iran policy. But at the end of the day, um, you know, if Iran, you know, if Iran gets the bomb or not, will not be decided in Berlin. It depends on what will be decided in Washington or at the very end in Jerusalem. So um, I, I don't think that um, Germany, as much as it wants, and you know, try to project itself as a as a player in this. Um, and uh, 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 at the end, it's important what will be decided going forward in Washington when it comes to the. Uh, nuclear weapons program, and that's something um, that I think is you know, important to 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 understand um, when we talk about this Iran policy in Germany. But again, I'm a little bit ho hopeful that we will see some gradual changes with the new government, and um, and I want to highlight, and that's something. Um, and as um, Mr. Joffe has said in his comments, and you know, look at the margins um, in the coalition agreement uh, for the first time, um, not only was the issue raised of the nuclear weapons program, but also the ballistic missiles program and the regional behavior. I mean, again, that seems to be a small thing in terms of German foreign policy, but this is a step forward um, addressing this issue and not just focusing on, on the nuclear weapons program. So. Um, this, you know, we we see some gradual changes, and um, but uh, again, I, you know, there will be no no um, uh, uh, you know, fundamental change because German voters are longing for stability and predictability, um, you know, domestically, foreign policy wise. That um, it is, you know, very hard to to change that, and but I guess. One of the problems here is that politicians in Germany for a very long period of time um, have not explained um, why, for example, we need to meet the 2% goal and uh, why, they're, um, uh, why we need you know, bigger defense spending, why NATO is important, why hard power matters. And um, so I think to reverse this, uh, this will take you know, a fairly long time. Let's close with some quick uh, final remarks uh, from Jamie, Melody, and then close with Dr. Jaffe. Um, I guess I'd say, if I just have maybe one overall impression from this, it's just how important history is and interpretations of history. And it's hard to think of another country actually where I think history plays more of a role in contemporary politics, foreign policy, uh, the implementation of certain social policies um, than Germany. And you can look at how, if someone's interpretation of history is different, it can lead to different political outcomes. So Mike was just talking about the interpretation of how the Cold War ended. And you have most Germans um, believe it's because, you know, Gorbachev was a nice guy and a lot of German people, uh, you know, were were nice to the Russians, and they all sort of held hands, and the and the Berlin Wall fell, um, and that has present day applications. That is used as a justification for not spending two percent on NATO, or for not being too aggressive against Russia, or for not being too aggressive against Iran, right? Um, and so I think it's just very important if, if you're gonna engage with the German debate, if you're gonna talk to Germans, whether citizens or politicians, you really have to have uh, a very keen understanding of the history of, of, of that country. And surely that, that, that applies to, to most countries, but I, I really can't think of another place where um, it's more influential and more important to the, to the present day political conversation. Let's get a quick 30 second closing remarks each from Melody and then Dr. Joffrey. 30 seconds is a challenge. I uh, believe that probably the, the major challenge for Germany 
in the coming decades is to bridge this incredibly present uh, role of the history with, um, with what future asks from German society and from the political establishment. And uh, looking back at the Iran policy, I do believe, and also picking up, Michael, what you said, Europe uh, and as its leader, Germany, do play a strong role and do have an impact also on US uh, foreign policy, at least to some extent. And I do believe that a more self-confident um, a German foreign policy vis-a-vis, -vis especially authoritarian regimes, fundamentalist regimes like Iran would be in the West, Western world's interest would be in Germany's interests. And, to, and the JCPOA, as I said, is a textbook example. Uh, another scenario after Trump left the agreement would have been, uh, for example, to build a solidaric front uh, between Europe and the US, then the past three years may have looked differently. So bridging the, the heavy gravitas of history um, with the challenging demands of the future, I think is a major challenge that uh, Germany, not only in its foreign policy, but also in, in the way it shapes its commemoration culture uh, is a main task at hand, I believe. Dr. Jaffe, please give us the final word. I want to have my last 30 seconds on, a, on the item. I think we, sh we, we might have discussed more or have another meeting on that, which is the future of, Jew of Jews in Germany. And here is some numbers, here are some numbers, which I find um, not very happy. <clears throat> the German community, Jewish community came, was at its height in 2007 with about 107,000 members, registered members. It's now down to 94,000. And here's an even more dramatic number. Last year, <clears throat> there were 225 births and 1,500 dead. So if you look at the statistic, you're almost forced to conclude that whatever the strategic implications are, that the German Jewish community is dying. And that goes less dramatically for the French and British community too. The three largest communities are declining ever so slowly. And <clears throat> I hope we can have another meeting where we try to figure out what is happening here and why. Well, I think uh, AJC and Tablet would love to have you all back to speak more about it um, today. So thank you all very much. And I'll uh, toss it back to my colleague, Claire at AJC to close us out. Thank you. And thank you to our esteemed guests for today's incredible conversation. And thank you to our global audience for tuning in today. AJC was proud to convene this series, 21st Century Europe and the Jews with our partners at Tablet Magazine. If you missed any of our previous programs on the United Kingdom, Poland, and France, you can watch those and more at ajc.org slash advocacyanywhere. Thank you again, and goodbye.